Good evening. I'll be reading from Ezekiel 18, 4 through 20. For anyone who belongs to me, the parents as well as the child, both alike belong to me, those who sin to the ones who will die. Suppose there's a righteous man who does what is just and right. He does not eat of the mountain shrines or looks to the idols of Israel. He does not defile his neighbor's wife. He does not oppress anyone, but return what he took in pledge as a loan. He does not commit robbery, but give his food to the hungry and provide clothing for the naked. He does not lend to them at interest or take profit from them. He withholds his hand from doing wrong and judges fairly between two parties. He follows, it, follows my decrees and faithfully keeps my laws. That man is righteous. He will surely live, declares the sovereign Lord. Suppose he has a violent son who sheds blood and does, every, does any of these other things, though the father has done none of them. He eats at the mountain shrines. He defiles his neighbor's wife. He oppresses the poor and needy. He commits robbery. He does not return what was took in pledge. He looks to idols. He does detestable things. He lends at interest and takes a profit. What such a man will live, he will not, because he does all these things, detestable things, and he is to be put to death. His blood will be on his own head. But, but, but suppose this son has a son who sees all these sins his father has committed and thought he sees them, does not do such things. He does not eat at the mountain shrines or, to, or look to idols of Israel. He does not defile his neighbor's wife. He does not oppress anyone or require a pledge for a loan. He does not commit robbery, but give his food to the hungry and provide clothing for the naked. He withholds his hand from mistreating the poor and takes no interest or profit from them. He keeps his laws and follows my decree. He will not die for his father's sins. He will surely live, but his father will die for his own sins because he practiced extortion robbery his brother and did not and did wrong among his people. Yet you ask, why does this son not share the guilt of this father? Since the son has done what is just and right and has been careful to keep all my decrees, he will surely live. The one who sins is the one who will die. The child will not share the guilt of the parent, nor will the parent share the guilt of the child. The righteous of the righteous will be consented to them, and the wicked of the wicked will be charged against them. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Good evening, everybody. It's good to see you all back this evening. I uh, hope you all had a great Easter Sunday. We had a wonderful worship this morning. A lot of great visitors and family uh, joined us this morning. I appreciate Sam for reading that long text, but you have to have the text to get the big picture of what we're going to be talking about uh, this evening. As we continue in our study of the Church of the Bible, we're going to look at a, a doctrinal belief by the Christian denominational world that is, kind of has two camps to it. In fact, it does have two camps to it. And it's the, the idea of whether or not a child is born sinful or a child is born innocent. The majority of the Christian world believes that children are born innocent into this world. They're born innocent into a sinful world. But there is a significant group of uh, denominations within the country and within the world that are of the belief that children are born sinful. They're born with the sin that they inherited from Adam. And so what I want to know is what does the Bible say? Because at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter what I think or what anybody else thinks, what one church teaches or what another denomination teaches. What matters is what does God's Word say. And it matters how did the church of the Bible look at this issue. And so we're going to look at those things tonight. Uh, you know, we live in a world today, like I've said many times in this series, uh, especially in this country, there are over 200 Christian denominations it baffles me that we can divide that much over one God and one book. But it's happened, and it's continuing to happen over things that really, at the end of the day, are not going to matter other than when we come to judgment. You know, we've not been called to worship God according to our preferences. We've been called to worship God according to His Word. 
And so it's, it's of great importance that we understand what God's Word says, what God's Word says in its proper context. And what I mean by that is not extracting uh, the Word out of context to support a denominational or doctrinal point, and that happens a lot. And so we need to look at the Bible as a whole within its context to see what God's Word says about this subject and many other subjects, many of which we've already covered, several of which we're going to continue to cover uh, in this series. And so tonight the question is raised, is a child born sinful or is a child born innocent? And so we're going to explore that this evening as we continue uh, in this series. Uh, But before we do that, let's go to God in prayer together. Our Father, we thank you for bringing us back together this evening on this day that is recognized by the world as Resurrection Sunday. We know that every first day of the week is to be celebrated around the resurrection of Jesus. Every worship service on the first day of the week is to be built around the communion that recognizes the body and the blood that Jesus gave at the cross, but also to celebrate the resurrection that came after that, the resurrection that Jesus enjoys and that he calls us to, not to a life of resurrection when this physical life is over, as we spoke of this morning, but to a life of resurrection now as baptized believers, covered symbolically in the blood of your Son and filled with the Holy Spirit that guides us, that comforts us, that directs us, That opens doors for us to lead others to you. Lord, I pray that that's what our mission is. That regardless of the talents that you've blessed us with, and you've blessed us all with different talents to use to bring more souls to the kingdom of Christ. Lord, help us to do that this week. Open doors, open windows of opportunity for us to share Jesus with someone. Lord, this question of whether a child is born sinful or innocent is a question that that many people are looking for the answers to. A lot of people who are part of Christian movements that, that teach and preach that children, babies, are born sinful, they wonder why or how they could come to that conclusion. Others that observe that children are born innocent and pure into a sinful world really don't give it much of a second thought. It's, it's something that we've wrapped our arms around. We understand that biblically, and it's not a question that comes across our mind, but we need to understand how to share with someone the truth of what your word says. And so I just ask, Lord, that this message, Spirit, will be your message, that you will speak powerfully to those who are seeking answers to this question. I pray that the message will be a powerful explanation of the biblical truth with regard to this question. Lord, we love you, we thank you, we praise you. In all things, in Jesus' name, amen. In our last session together, if you remember, we talked about the Calvinistic approach to predestination, as well as the once saved, always saved uh, proposition and doctrine that the majority of the denominational world adheres to. And and what that means is, is that predestination from a Calvinistic standpoint states that some people were determined by God before creation ever happened that they were going to be lost, and there was nothing they could do about it. Also, that God predestined before the creation of the world that Uh, a a much smaller number of people would be saved, and they could do nothing about that either. That's Calvinistic predestination. Once saved, always saved is a doctrine that I grew up in the denomination that I grew up in as a child. In fact, generations of family members before me grew up with the same belief. Once you're saved, you're always saved. There's no way you can lose your salvation. And that was based upon what Jesus said in John chapter 10. No one can snatch you out of the Father's hand. But you know what? We can walk away anytime we choose. And that happens to a lot of people. And the proof text from last week was from Galatians chapter 5, where Paul 
talks to the Jewish Christians there about holding circumcision over their Gentile brothers. And he says very plainly in chapter 5, verse 4 of the Galatian letter, you who are trying to hold circumcision over your brothers have been severed from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. Now, I may be from East Texas, but I can tell you this, you can't be severed from something you were never a part of. And you can't fall from somewhere you ain't ever been. And so that text right there, in and of itself, blows once saved, always saved, completely out of the water. But we looked at a number of texts that support that point as well. In this session, we're going to be looking at another Calvinistic doctrine that permeates the denominational world. And that is the doctrine of total depravity, otherwise known as the belief that children are born sinful into this world. And Calvinism, if you're not familiar with it, Calvinism is the theological views of John Calvin. And John Calvin lived from the year 1509 to 1564. And in a nutshell, his theology is built around an acronym, T-U-L-I-P. It's referred to amongst theologians simply as TULIP. And so what exactly is TULIP? What is this this theological belief system that Calvin had. Well, TULIP consists of these elements, total depravity, unconditional election, which we talked about last week, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and the perseverance of the saints. And so, just so we can get a little bit of background on what we're going to try to cover this evening, I feel that it's necessary to look at this Calvinistic idea known as total depravity. And the reason why is because that is the driving force behind infant baptism in so many denominations today. Now, again, just as a reminder from last week in our session together, dealing with predestination and the the once saved, always saved doctrines, Calvin's idea of unconditional election, again, states very clearly that some are predetermined, predestined, if you will, by God to be lost and some to be, and and, and a very, very much smaller number to be saved. And there's nothing you can do about it because it's unconditional election. God said it, that's it, you can't do nothing about it. But you know, we pulled a scripture up that totally refutes that as well. Peter wrote, he said that God is patient, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Again, last time I checked, in East Texas, all means all. And so that, again, lets us know that God predestined everyone to be saved by the blood of His Son. So what's meant by total depravity? That sounds like a deep subject, doesn't it? Doesn't sound very positive. Well, it's not. But what is meant by total depravity? Well, it's this theological belief that John Calvin came up with that original sin has been passed from one generation to the next all the way back from the time of Adam and Eve. So Adam and Eve's original sin has been passed on from generation to generation to generation. In other words, since Adam sinned, everybody else who came after him were born sinners. Not because of their own sins, but because of his sin. So because of this original sin of Adam, the belief is is that we're all born sinners, according to Calvin. You know, many times when you ask somebody about where that idea comes from scripturally, uh, it's deer in the headlights and crickets chirping. And the reason why is because they can't really take you to book, chapter, and verse in scripture to support that because scripturally it's very, very thin. Here's what usually will happen. They'll quote Calvin. 
Or they'll quote John Knox or Augustine or Tertullian or one of the other church fathers from the 3rd, 4th, 5th century or various creeds and councils that men came up with to support the doctrine. Very rarely will you hear book, chapter, and verse to support infant baptism. You can't find it. However, if you really press somebody hard on it, there are a few scriptures that they will go to. For example, Psalm chapter 14, verses 2 and 3, which says, The Lord has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there are any who understand who seek after God. This is the point that they make here. They have all turned aside together. They have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Now take a good look at that. This has been used as a total depravity proof text. And it's very thin. That right there is supposed to prove that we're born sinful. Now, let's look at what it does prove. Let's look at what it actually does prove. First, it proves that people were corrupt. Okay, there's some point in time where we are all corrupted. We all become sinful. But it doesn't prove that anybody was born corrupt. Look at what it says. It doesn't prove that anybody was born corrupt as total depravity dictates. Family, this passage says that the son of men have, quote, all turned aside Together, they have become corrupt. Now think about that for just a second. Let's look at the text and what it actually does say. It would have been impossible for them to have turned aside and to have become corrupted if they had been born that way. Does that make sense? The fact clearly laid out in this passage is that they turned aside and they became corrupted is proof that they were not born that way. Another proof text that's offered to defend the concept of total depravity is found in Psalm 51, verse 5. And this is one that we're, we're all fairly familiar with. And this is where David, the man after God's own heart, says this, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. This is a little bit stronger text for total depravity. Now those who adhere to that, those who use this as a proof text for infant baptism because infants are born sinful, advocate that David was born a sinner based upon what that says right there. But here's the thing. The wording of the passage doesn't give any credibility to that interpretation. Yes, sin is mentioned in this verse. But it's committed before David was born. You see that? He was conceived as a result of sin. He was born into a sinful world, but he was not born sinful. Again, I go back to our base text that Sam read just a few moments ago in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20, where God himself says this, God says, the person who sins will die. The son will not bear the punishment for the father's iniquity. Take a good look at what God himself says right there. Look at the words of God. And now apply that to David's case. Lay it down side by side with this doctrine of total depravity. In what David says in Psalm 51 verse 5, the doctrine of total depravity does not apply to David. David's not guilty of the sins of his parents who committed sin, and in the course of committing that sin, David was conceived. According to God himself, David bears no guilt for the sin by which he was conceived. Family, probably one of the strongest scriptures supporting the total depravity argument is 
can be found in Psalm 58, verse 3. This is where David says, The wicked are estranged from the womb. These who speak lies go astray from birth. Now, that's a little bit stronger text. Notice we're moving, we're moving from weaker texts to stronger texts that may support or that those who adhere to total depravity and the sinfulness of infants, we're moving into stronger passages for their argument. And take a look at what David says right there in Psalm 58, verse 3. Total depravity states that we're born sinful. We, we enter this world as sinful infants. David says right there that they went astray when? After they were born. Can you see that? They were sinful. They were estranged from the womb. And so if it happened after they were born, how soon did it happen after they were born? Well, look at the text. Always have to go to the text and see what the text says. The text says, according to the text, their going astray was the result of speaking lies. You see that? That's what David says. Now, here's the thing. The last time I checked, infants can't speak. If you come across a baby that exits the womb in the delivery room and starts rattling off Shakespeare or something, let me know. Infants can't speak. In fact, toddlers have a pretty difficult time putting together uh, complete sentences, unless you're Ryland. Okay? He does a pretty good job. But by and large, for the most part, infants have a difficult time putting together complete sentences, let alone formulating lies, as David says right there. Also, at what point does a child begin to wrap their head around the concept that they have sinned against God and can fully commit to repentance and accept God's forgiveness in baptism? At what age does that happen? Now, if you go back to Jewish culture and, and the, the tradition of bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah for young ladies, that happens at the age of 13 for boys and the age of 12 for girls. That's a tradition. In their culture, that's when you become accountable for your own faith. Well, that's 12 or 13. That's not infant. But that's beside the point. From what David says in that text that we were just looking at, we are clearly not born sinful. In his words, our estrangement from God because of sin takes place sometime after we're born. So now the question is this. We've looked at a few passages that are called upon in support of total depravity, in support of infants being born sinful, in support of infant baptism, pouring, sprinkling, to cleanse them of the sin that they were born with, the original sin that they say came down from Adam through all the generations. We've looked at some passages about that. Passages that I think are very easily disproven, as we've looked at this evening. Well, what are some passages that clearly refute this doctrine of total depravity and come to the conclusion that we are born innocent? That we're not born sinful, that we're not born into this world carrying the sin of Adam from generation to generation to generation. Well, Genesis chapter 8 verse 21 tells us that we become sinners in our youth rather than at our birth. According to God in Genesis chapter 8 verse 21, after the flood, listen to what he says. It says, Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth. Now take a good look at what God says there. I confess, that's true for me. I suspect that it's true for you too. I can't remember anything prior to about eight or nine years old. But I can tell you right now, 
when that scripture right there applied to me. It was in my youth. We need to take what God says right there and lay aside and lay that beside the concept of total depravity, which states that we're born sinful. That's not what God's saying right there. So what does God say right there? He says a man's heart is evil from his youth. Now family, if a man's heart became evil in his youth, then his heart must have been pure before his youth. Does that make sense? And this can only mean that we were born pure. We were born innocent. We were born sinless, which refutes this doctrine of total depravity. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 7 tells us that our spirit is given by our maker. And so if that's the case, we have to, we have to ask some questions. We have to do some, some logical reasoning here. If we're born sinful, then that can only mean that the Lord gave us a sinful spirit. Does that make sense? I mean, it adds up. It doesn't make sense, but it adds up. If we're born sinful and the Lord gives us our spirit, then the Lord gave us a sinful spirit. <clears throat> Listen to what Solomon tells us. He says, Then the dust will return to the earth as, as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Now take a good look at that. That was written by the wisest man to walk this earth other than Jesus Christ. And consider what he says. He says, the spirit, your spirit, my spirit, will return to the God who gave it. Now ask yourself this question. If God has given us a corrupted spirit, as total depravity says, then how can it be just and how can it be fair for God to hold us responsible for our corruption? Think about that for just a second. Total depravity tells us that we are born corrupted. So it would stand to reason, it would mean that God gave us a corrupted spirit and now He's going to condemn us for it? Is that fair? Is that something that a just God would do? It's not just and it's not fair. And that's why the doctrine of total depravity is false. In Paul's famous speech on Mars Hill, we discover that an infant is not depraved because God is not depraved. We see this in Acts chapter 17, verses 28 to 30. And this is what Paul says. He says, For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God... We ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now He commands all men everywhere to repent. Now take a look at what He says there. He's talking to intellectuals. He's talking to people who even have a, a, a shrine to an unknown God. They're trying to cover all of their bases. But look at what Paul says right there. He says, For we are also His offspring, and therefore since we are the offspring of God. Now lay those statements right there that Paul makes down next to the doctrine of total depravity which states that we're born sinful and we are born with a sinful spirit. Now let's think about this logically. If this is the case, 
then you can come to no other conclusion than to believe that since we are the offspring of God, as, as, as Paul says, and are born depraved, as Calvin says, then God, according to Calvin, must also be depraved. Which is clearly false. But there's no other way to look at it. If you take what Calvin says, this concept of total depravity, and you reason it out, laid down next to the Scriptures, it's false. It is completely false. And so if no one can accuse God of being depraved, then it stands to reason that no one can accuse his offspring of being depraved. Again, family, total depravity states that children are born sinful. They're born sinful. But as we've clearly seen thus far, that's clearly a false teaching of man. But there's another point we can look at this evening. Where we can see that children cannot be born sinful and they cannot be born depraved into this world. Jesus tells us, remember what Jesus said? Jesus tells us that we must become as little children in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, if we're born sinful and we're born depraved, why in the world would he do that? Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 to 3. It says, At that time the disciples came to Jesus and said, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a child to himself and set him before them and said, Truly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become like little children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now take a good look at that. We're all familiar with that. Because we are of the belief, scripturally, that children are born innocent, we look at this from a certain perspective. That these are innocent children, an innocent child that Jesus has brought to the apostles. He said, hey, you need, you need to become like this little child. But here's the thing. A large portion of the Christian denominational world teaches that children must be sprinkled in baptism. Now why is that? It's because they believe that they're born depraved in a sinful world. Because the sin that they've inherited from their parents all the way back to Adam and Eve in the garden is upon them. Now, if that were the case, why would Jesus tell the apostles and tell us in his word that we need to become like little children in order to enter the kingdom of heaven? Does that make sense? I don't see that it does. Family, through the lens of Calvinism, what Jesus is saying right there on the screen is that we have to become sinful. And depraved to enter the kingdom of heaven. If you apply Calvinism to that scripture right there, you can come to no other conclusion. Now, does that make any sense at all? It really doesn't. When you consider what the doctrine says laid down against what God's word says, it's abundantly clear that this doctrine of total depravity is completely false. Children are born innocent, not sinful. And I believe that this is clearly what David was thinking with regard to his child that was born to him in Bathsheba. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, the child that passed away, the child that died. Family, David was not of the belief that his child, who died as a result of of his sin was born sinful. Even though his child was conceived after David's sin of sending Bathsheba's husband Uriah the Hittite to the front in order to be killed in action, even though David had sinned by coveting Bathsheba for himself, even though David had sinned by conceiving a child with Bathsheba who was the wife of another man, 
This child was born pure and innocent because David's sin and Bathsheba's sin did not rest upon him. It was David who was sinful, not this child. And in his mourning, after this child has passed away, this child that remains nameless, because that child did not survive to the eighth day to be circumcised and receive a name under the covenant. In his mourning, David says in verse 23, I will go to him, but he will not return to me. Now take a good look at what David says right there about this child that was born out of a sinful act. That was his sin and Bathsheba's sin. David, even though he was just as sinful as anybody else, just as sinful as any one of us, the man who the Lord himself says is a man after his own heart was not of the belief that his child died with a corrupted spirit or any sin upon him. Look at what David says. I will go to him, but he will not return to me. Family, something that we have to realize with regard to sin is that it is a violation against God either by commission or omission. What does that mean? Sounds like preacher speak to me. Family, sin is a transgression by commission when we choose to commit it. By commission, when we choose to sin. So in order to choose to sin, we have to have the capacity in order to make that conscious choice. Otherwise, we can't be held accountable for it by God. John writes in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Look at what John says right there. John tells us that we choose to practice sin. And that practice is considered lawlessness by God. But James, with regard to sin committed by omission... In chapter 4, verse 17, says, Whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him, that is sin. I can tell you right now, Devin LeBay has been on both sides of that coin. I'm guilty of sin by commission, knowing good and well what I was doing, and sin of omission, knowing good and well what I should have done that I didn't do. So how does a baby know how to deal with that? How does an infant know what sin is in order to commit it? And how does a baby know the right thing to do and then fail to do it and commit sin? The answer is they don't. The reality is is that they can't. And because they can't, then this doctrine of total depravity is completely false. Because sin is either a transgression of something wrong or sin is an omission of something right against God. So what this means is that sin is absolutely impossible for children to inherit from their parents. And the reason why is because it's not an inherent quality. And because of that, there's no reason to sprinkle babies for sins they haven't committed and sins they didn't inherit. There's no reason to pour water over their head for the same purpose. The people who practice this call it baptism. Well, if you were here a few weeks ago when we talked about what baptism is, that's not even baptism. Baptism, the word baptism in our English Bible, if you remember, is a transliteration of the Greek. Baptizo, and it means to immerse, or to submerge, or to plunge. Can you imagine how a baby would react to that? It's probably why they sprinkle them. Probably why they pour water over their little heads. I want to go back to our base text as we begin to wrap up this evening. 
Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 4 to 20. Family, this text very, very accurately lays out the case. This text lays out the refutation of total depravity, as does other passages that we've looked at. And what the Lord clearly says in this text is that a child shall not bear responsibility for the sins or the iniquities of their parents. Children aren't guilty of the sins that their parents commit. Parents aren't guilty of the sins that their children commit. Now granted, they bear some responsibility for it with the law. But the point is, children are not responsible for the sins of their parents. Look again at verse 4. God says, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. And God says, the soul who sins shall die. I'll take a good look at that. What the Lord is saying there is that every individual is responsible for their own sins. The Lord repeats this again in verse 20 by saying this. He says, The soul whose sins shall die, the son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. Family, you can't get any clearer than that. That's crystal right there. That is crystal clear. All of the passages that we've looked at tonight in this session conclusively prove, I believe, that the Calvinistic doctrine of total depravity is a false doctrine of man, not a teaching of the Bible. Even the passages that those who hold to this doctrine and claim as proof text in support of this doctrine ultimately disprove it when you break it down and look at it, as we have. The Bible clearly teaches that children are born innocent and that each individual is responsible for their own sins. So because of this, the Lord responds with these words in verse 21 of chapter 18. Listen to what he says. But if a wicked person turns away from all his sins that he has committed and keeps all my statutes and does what is just and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Now look at what God said. Look at what the Father said all the way back in Ezekiel. Family, the way that we turn away from our sins is by repenting of them. And in effect, that's what God is saying right there. We turn away from our sins by repenting of those sins, and that's what it means to turn away. The word repent literally means to turn. And because of what Jesus did at the cross, and because of what happened on the third day after that, that the world has recognized today, we have something available to us. You and I have something available to us that the people of Ezekiel's time didn't have. We can have our sins washed away in baptism. That is the gospel. That is what Easter is all about. And that's a message that a lot of people today have not heard. I can promise you that there are Thousands of churches in this country alone that talked about the resurrection of Jesus Christ today and never once mentioned the word baptism. Because they don't associate the two together. The resurrection of Jesus and baptism are married to one another in the most beautiful way. And so tonight, if you have not made that commitment to the Lord. I want to encourage you to do that. If you need to come forward and let us pray with you and pray for you about something that you're struggling with, let let us do that. Let us pray with you. Let us pray for you. If you have a friend or family member that is of the belief because of the church they grew up in or the denomination that they belong to that, that teaches
that children are born sinful. But you know, and quite honestly, truth be told, they know that that can't possibly be right biblically. I want to encourage you to share this message with them. If you're joining us online at a later time, and this is useful, I hope that you'll share it with your friends and loved ones that are of this belief. And that they'll consider what the biblical text has to say about that and how the church of the Bible viewed it. If you have a need tonight, whatever it is, please respond to the Lord while we stand and sing.